but thank you so much for being here today. Um, I think I know most of you, but if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Jonathan Ingram. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Faith Co-op, and we are honored to host this Lunch and Learn series. So thank you for making time. I know there's a million things you could be doing today, um, and if you're working remotely, there's a million places you could be. So I'm honored that you made uh, intention to be here today, and I hope you, the conversation can be something that you enjoy. Faith Co-op is a nonprofit here in Chattanooga, and our, our goal is to help awaken Christians to how their faith brings daily purpose. Uh, each of you uh, goes somewhere or, or work somewhere or want to work somewhere 40 to 60 hours a week of your life, a huge portion of what you do. I spend more time at my job than with my kids, and I hope it's something that God cares about. And our, and our hope with our organization is that we can provide a vision for you and the work that you're called to do, that, that God, one, that God cares about it, and two, that it's a way for you to commune with the Father, and it's something that is, has eternal significance. We put on a lot of different things through our organization. There's two fellowships we offer that are nine months long for different age groups. Um, we have a faith-driven entrepreneur, faith-driven investor network. So if you're in any of those spaces, we can plug you in so a community of people who are thinking about that. We have a class that we teach in churches called Faith and Work 101. And then we have our Lunch and Learn series that you're at today. And you're at the sixth of a six-part series on who is my neighbor. Uh, we, we've been running through this going, in Scripture, the Bible talks a lot about that we're called to love God with all of our heart and love your neighbor as ourselves. And as I talk with leaders all over town, the phrase comes up that they are driven in their work by this idea of loving their neighbor. And I thought it'd be really fun to have a series where we actually allow people from different professions and industries to talk about, in light of their faith, what does it mean to love your neighbor? And so we've talked to people who are in the food and hospitality industry, to HR professionals, to marketing people, financial planners. Uh, we just did one with the Parks and Rec Department. And with the whole goal of understanding what it means to love in light of that context and how our understanding of the gospel shapes how we enter those spaces and the type of work we're called to do. And so I'm really excited to have our amazing panel here to talk about this weird thing that has existed for a lot longer than the last four years, but it has grown exponentially since COVID, this idea of working remotely. And some of you work remotely in healthcare. Some of you work remotely in a business setting. Some of you, are, you have your own company. Some of you don't work remotely. Some of you wish you worked remotely. Some of you wish you didn't work remotely. And we wanted just to walk into the space and have a conversation. And I wanted to invite some people to be on a panel that this idea of working remotely isn't just a four-year-old conversation. Uh, that, that's been part of their journey uh, in their work and in their faith for a lot longer. And so could you help me welcome uh, Natalie, David Martin, and Joey Slabs uh, to, our, to our panel? <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for doing this and being part of, a part of today. Uh, so before we get going, can you, just, can you each, and you know, we have a married couple, so you guys can figure out how you want to navigate this question, but can you tell us about yourself? Tell us about the work you do uh, and how you got into the, the field that you're in. All right, so uh, I'm David Martin. I'm Natalie. Uh, and we run a PR agency here in town called Heed Public Relations. Uh, last week, I think it was last week, we had our sixth birthday of our business, uh, which uh, is an absolute blessing because six years ago we started it on a hope and a prayer, like, Lord, please help us pay the bills. Uh, and so still being around six years later uh, has just been uh, remarkable. It's been a, a wonderful um, blessing. Uh, for myself, I have been in the communications landscape um, for probably 15-ish uh, years, uh, kind of in, in various capacities. Uh, right before we started Heed PR, I was kind of a, um, making my way through uh, the, the startup landscape here in Chattanooga. Um, and uh, and the, what got us to starting Heed PR uh, was the last place that I was an employee uh, after we had a very successful launch. They wanted everybody to move to Oregon. And I thought, well, um, Oregon sounds like a great place to visit. Uh, beautiful, but I love Chattanooga. Um, I've, I love being a part of this community. It has uh, wrapped its arm around me and, and created a lot of opportunities for myself. And we'd always talked about doing our own thing. And that I, we feel like looking back, that was the Lord saying, I can't make this more obvious. You know, do it now. So uh, six years later, here we are. 
I would just, yeah, so everything David said is true. Um, <laughs> so um, leading up to launching our business, I had always been um, like David in different communications roles, but most recently, uh, prior to our business launch, I had been in a lot of project management roles. Um, and we kind of realized that while we had overlapping skills, we were more like yin and yang when it came to um, what we preferred to do. Um, so that's worked out really well for the two of us. Um, I joked with Mel, I tried to say no to being on this panel because I pushed David in front all the time. Um, I like to stay in the background, so that's how uh, we're able to work together. <laughs> we right. just do different portions and trust each other to be doing the right things at the right time. So, yeah. We negotiated for you to make it. Yeah, <laughs> it worked. So thank, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, um, so I am a videographer and photographer. Um, I started uh, doing that when I was uh, like 12 or 14 and started making money around that time. Um, as I was one of those weird homeschool kids. Uh, and so 20, I've been doing it almost 25 years. Um, I've been self-employed for about 20. And I have two businesses now. Um, and uh, I think it's not really a path I chose. It kind of chose me a little bit, you know? Like I fell into it. Um, yeah, and so I've kind of learned most of my lessons just through doing it really poorly for like a long time and then getting burned out, you know? <laughs> Uh, and then being like, oh, I did that for five years and like I feel miserable and then like actually implementing a change. So most of my, that's how my, most of my stuff I've learned over the years is that. But that's me. Oh, and also I went to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. So I'm really interested in kind of the communication marketing space and business and how that overlaps with kind of theology and stuff like that. And so your, your, biz, your companies, you're in videography work, doing weddings, and what's... Yeah, so I have two companies. One is a wedding company. Uh, I've got like eight people that work under that company. And I basically copy and paste those people into a commercial uh, company called Wizardly Studio. That's cool. Yeah, and the guy that's in the back or wherever he is, Clay, uh, we work together a lot. So Clay, Clay's a good, good friend. So you all run your, you run your small businesses. It, allow, it does give you that flexibility to work from anywhere. You know, we're going to jump into talking about how, what it looks like, but what do you love about working remotely? What is a challenge about not having, were you being able to be anywhere to do your work? Kind of pros and cons of the, the situation. Uh, for me, um, so, you know, we work with a, a purposefully a, a tight roster of clients, um, and the vast majority of them are here in this general area. Every once in a while, we'll, we'll take a, a, a project that, or work with a client that is somewhere else. Um, but uh, usually they're small to medium-sized businesses that are growing, and they're in all different industries, which is great for me because I have ADD really bad. So I'm able to do like some tech-related work in the morning and then some nonprofit stuff in the afternoon and um, all that stuff. But for me, my favorite thing about working remotely is that um, we're very, uh, we're producers. Like we just produce insane amounts of deliverables on behalf of our clients. Uh, and my favorite part is the scheduling that comes with it. Uh, I will absolutely work myself um, into the ground, you know, Monday through Wednesday, so I can maybe have a three day weekend by the time Friday gets around. Uh, just building that schedule and also, uh, that enables us, or at least me, to have that, um, that thing that we all chase, uh, a good work-life balance. Uh, so I can actually run some errands in the middle of the day, or I can go uh, sit on a committee meeting for a board that I'm on uh, in the middle of the day, whereas previously that would have been a very tough thing for me to do uh, in a traditional nine to five where I'm in my cubicle uh, and breaking away is not a very easy thing to do. I agree. Productivity would be my favorite. I'd say the challenge is just, I'm sure what you're all thinking, just the human connection piece. Um, I miss having coworkers besides David sometimes. We'll get to 3.30 uh, p.m. and I'm saying, get me out of this house. I need to talk to someone. Um, and it needs to not be you, not because you just don't want to hear it anymore, you know, at a certain point. Um, I've got to be a little empathetic to my partner. So um, that, that would be, I'd say, the pro and con that jump out to me? Yeah, similar to that. Um, I think the pro is the con, which is for me like the infinite quality of remote work. In other words, like on my way here, I was like using Siri to respond to multiple work messages on my phone. Um, I wasn't typing them out because I wanted to be safe. 
Uh, it's still probably illegal. <laughs> but there's something about remote work. If you have electricity, it's infinite. And that can be really helpful because I can just get a lot done. Like to your point, David, I can cram in so much more work than people could, you know, 50 years ago in a three day work week, a four day work week, whatever. If you want to have that three, you know, four, four on, three off kind of new hybrid that people are exploring. But the downside is the same thing, right? It's infinite. And um, it can be very hard to ever cut it off. So I think that the, the pro is the con for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you, know, so you mentioned some of your clients are local. You should probably get to see them. Same for you. Mm -hmm. But some of the clients you work with are people maybe you'll never meet in person. You're never going to get to know. So what does a productive, successful relationship look like with some of these clients that will always be in a remote kind of setting unless something crazy happens? How do you cultivate a successful relationship? And what are, what are the things that kind of measure that for you guys? Uh, yeah, we, David and I talked about this a little bit um, before coming here. And I, I think. For us, it's um, being extremely conscientious and always delivering on what you say you're going to deliver on and more. Um, it's you know not just meeting deadlines, but exceeding deadlines. It's um, letting them know you're thinking about them if they're not in your inbox. Um, that I think does a goes a long way to build trust um, and ensure folks know that you have their best intentions at heart. Yeah, I think in, in the remote setting. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a people person as well. Like I, uh, I don't think I'm a full extrovert, but I, I definitely get charged up from being with people that uh, I, I connect with uh, and enjoy being with. Um, uh, but I think what is what we have to be very mindful of is um, uh, being very proactive in um, having our presence felt as best as we can make it felt in that remote setting. Um, because when you're in the office, um, I, I, I used to pass a trip 10 times a day at Bell Hops, um, uh, uh, usually at the, the beer keg when we were allowed to tap it at 4 o'clock. Afternoon, right? Yeah, afternoon, yeah, yeah. Um, when all our work was done. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, or you go to uh, um, you know those meetings that could have been emails, um, and where you're, you're like seeing people, you're seeing the people that your managers that you you uh, may not have any deliverables that uh, that meet up with each other on any given day, but you're still meeting up with each other in those kind of uh, opportune uh, moments in the office. So looking at that through a, rem a remote lens, like we are very active and finding ways to have our presence felt uh, in the lives of our, uh, uh, our clients that we work with, whether that's uh, texting about something related to work or something completely unrelated to work, uh, or um, just finding ways that we can have something from our end be delivered into their, that manifests into their real world. Yeah. Natalie loves to, we talked about this uh, earlier, uh, Natalie loves to send um, uh, ham and goodies. I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, the Knoxville uh, uh, lemon cookies. Yeah, uh, so uh, we send lemon cookies everywhere now that that's a possible thing, just so we can have that ability to like insert ourselves into the, the daily lives uh, of the people that we work with because we don't have those moments of just serendipitous interaction. One, I would just say, in a, in a considerate way, though, too, because um, there's the balance to strike. You don't want to constantly be drawing on someone's time if um, they're busy, too. But so we try to be super considerate about how we're reaching out, when we're reaching out, what we're asking for, those kinds of things, too. I think that's another, another way to do that. Sorry, Joey. Oh, it's fine. Those are great. And do you ever send like non-cookies or is it always just cookies? We lead with cookies. Yeah. Uh, if it's an object, it's a cookie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as small as of a gesture that is, I like that because like materiality, like something physical always is like what you want. And so if you can't physically be there, I love that you're like, here's a, a physical thing that we're going to send you, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, you know, it reminds me of the Eucharist a little bit, you know, like it's like the body and the blood, you're taking it physically, even though it's a secular version of that. <laughs> Obviously, it's not, it's not communion, but it's still food, you know, um, and that matters. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an homage to that that physical presence. Um, 
Can you, so the, ask the question one more time. Yeah, just how, how do you measure when you think about building genuine relationships with any clients that you're not going to ever see in person mm. or very rarely? What's it look like to move beyond just the transactional in de nature of the... Oh, of yeah, the yeah. Well, with my work, I usually have to be in person um, at least once yeah. um, because of, you know, video and photography. Unless Cora, you know, OpenAI's thing takes over everything. <laughs> Then, then, then I could change everything. If you're, um, if you're not familiar, that's like the AI video thing that's been in beta right now. Um, I, I have like a, a scale uh, that I've kind of developed mentally. It's a, basically a scheme. And the scheme is basically like on one side is what I would call thin embodiment, and the other side would call thick embodiment. So thin embodiment would be uh, interactions that you don't use your body very much, so like texting, Slack messages, Etc. those kinds of things. Emails, right? You're just like typing them with your fingers. That would be thin. Thick would be f physically in person. So whenever I'm interacting with my clients, I try to choose the option that is as thick as possible. Like, so if there's an option to do a Zoom call instead of a phone call, Zoom calls, you have to kind of use your hands more. You're aware that you're on this camera. Uh, I, I think that those things strike or create more f intimacy and vulnerability um, than just like texting would. So that, that is the grid that I fall on. So just, just the other day, I had a call with um, a girl named Michelle who owns a company called Events with Taste. It's a catering company in town. Um, she's great. She's one of the best caterers in, in the city. And we had a phone call about a project, a uh, video project. And I called her and said, hey, we're, our meeting's in, we're supposed to do this call in five minutes, but where's your office? And she was like, oh, it's off broad. And I'm like, hey, I'm five minutes away. Can I just come to you? Because in my mind, I'm thinking about this grid. Like, I always want to go thicker than thinner. And so she was like, that's fine, just come by. Anyway, we ended up having this great, longer conversation, like ever, like you were with you and Trip, you know? Like there's something about when you can be more physical, choose it. So we, we use that grid in our family, like when we can walk somewhere, you know, using your body is walking versus driving. So we kind of use that grid on any sort of technological uh, uh, venture, you know? Um, but, but with remote work, I found that that's, that's a helpful guiding principle, is always choose the thicker option. I was in a, I was in a discussion with some CEOs about caring for remote workers and they didn't use the language of thin and thick but it was always that idea of the most embodied thing we can do yeah. so a zoom call or yeah. uh, uh over zoom happy hour we're, we're sending you something in the mail that you're you're taking you know things that so this, this is movement t towards even in remote setting to the things that can feel cl that, that, like that language of the thickness of the relationship yeah and i mean a, dri a driving principle for me is like um if, if i believe god became molecules Right? and still is molecules, and he became fully present. I love the Eugene Peterson uh, translation of John chapter 1, where he says, like, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Yeah. Which, which all, all of us have probably heard that before. But it's just the idea that, like, we worship a God who is, like, the most fully present human and became fully present to us. And so Christians should have sort of a e driving ethic of being physically present as much as possible. But then we can't. I love that you have that same impulse, like, send, send something, you know. Um, that's physical. Yeah. You know. One of the things Joey has done is done a lot of work on embodiment. Mel, are you in here somewhere? Yeah. So J Joey sent me some art that people have done to try to picture some of these things. So we're going to put a few things up here. But on the screen, this this we thought this was a beautiful thing of this desire that we have for connection, right? Uh, and how 3D it is. There's an embodiment component of that. That as we're all talking. We can't always get to that place where you can go like Joey did to the office, but how do we move in that direction? Mm -hmm. Joey started answering the question that, I, that we'll just jump to, I think is a really Sorry. important one, and this is good, but leave, you can leave that up there, Mel. But as people of faith, and as we're talking the theoretically about how to serve customers, Joey just went, did a great thing of just tying us into what that meant, like how his view of Jesus shapes that for him. Mm -hmm. um, you feel, feel, feel free to add to that, too, and I would love to hear from you all about how your faith kind of informs that, that movement that's more than a transactional thing and how, how your faith in Christ kind of is, is your encouragement in that direction. Um, I firmly believe that we are called to lift one another up. Um, in, in, in my life, that has kind of been, uh, I, I've, I've seen that manifest itself in so many different ways from, like, seemingly trivial things to... Uh, truly impactful things. I mean, I'm like, oh, I was in basketball as a point guard. I was dishing out assists. I was lifting my team up. Yeah, you know, they were, they were making the baskets. I was, you know. In our work, we shine spotlights on the good work that people are, do, are doing, and so we, we lift them up. Um, we, we, I mean, it, it, we work to put, we call it the halo effect on our clients and their businesses. I mean, 
Um, but I, I think one thing that we do that we kind of take that step further um, that really gets to the, the, the human um, element of the people that we work with and, and takes us into a, a thicker arrangement uh, with our clients is, yes, we do a lot of, and we perform, and we put out a lot of, of, of work. Uh, again, I, I've said the word a million times already, but deliverables, right? Press releases and awards applications and you know, all of that stuff. Uh, but something that we do uh, and I think that ha helps create incredible bonds between us and our clients uh, and our peers, like, like I don't want to forget them, like the contractors that we work with, the other agencies that we work with, um, is that we also seek to lift up the actual people that we're working with. Um, and so a lot of times what that looks like is our points of contacts at our um, uh, clients uh, that we work with, like we become advocates of those people as well. Um, I have sent uh, a, a million uh, emails and, and had calls where, you know, we say, okay, we get through all the stuff that the business needs, and I'll say, well, what about you? Like, like, or even wh what about your team members? Or what about your team members? Yeah. Do you have anybody like that is actually doing like really incredible work that we can put a, a, a spotlight on in their own right? Um, do you want? have you wanted to be on Chattanooga's 20 under 40 list uh, or be a part of Leadership Chattanooga? Like, let me do that nomination for you. And again, that, we're not talking about the press release of you know, the new COO being hired that no one's met yet, but this person that we work with, we understand that like, they have things that uh, need to be taken care of and, and they need to feel celebrated. To celebrate this guy, he wouldn't tell you, but he uh, has a thousand point ball from his time in uh, <laughs> high school basketball. Double sticks, a bit of a legend. So he alluded to it, but yeah. yeah. I was such a good high school basketball player that I became a cheerleader in college. <laughs> so, the <good> story. <laughs> um. The question, so the question is being like the... Just how's your, yeah, how does, how does what your understanding of Jesus, how's your faith, mm, yeah. as we've been talking about relationships with clients, and I love that you tied in the other stakeholders. I think that's really important in remote work that remote work, even though you're by yourself, there's stakeholders that are the clients, but th there's also other ones that you have, you're having to think about. But uh, how yeah, I think, I, I think that as we become more remote and more virtual, which certainly seems to be what's going to happen, um, you know, I'll probably end up buying the Apple Vision Pros for, to, so I don't have to have a massive screen, you know? It's like maybe the Gen 2 or something, or Gen 3. So, like, I see that as, like, that's probably where I'm going to have to head with my work, is I'm probably going to have to wear goggles, you know? <laughs> as we become more virtual, it seems like that, that the skills that are needed for physical presence will diminish over time, um, both, like, in the church and outside of the church. And, I, and for me, a guiding principle is... Um, one of my favorite scholars, a guy named Michael Morales, he talks about that the driving force in the history of redemption is Yahweh making a way to dwell with his people once more. So, like, not to get all theological, but I love theology, so sorry. Um, but one of, the, one of the strains of scripture that starts in the garden, the expulsion from the divine presence, is, is Yahweh trying to make a way to get that presence back, right? And so the animal sacrifices are this weird form of getting the presence back. And so it's all throughout scripture, um, God's trying to figure out how to create presence again, how to create physical presence again. And so that is certainly like a driving factor um, that really influences my life in a really different way, in a really important way, is physical presence. Um, and, and, and I think that what I like about this piece of art is like, there is something about the, that technology, whether it's our phones, whether it's social media, whether it's like screens like this, that, um, create this disordering effect that I've been I personally very drawn to, which I've, I've heard it said that like these, these things tend to create this situation where I'm no longer being seen doing something, but now I'm doing something to be seen. This weird flip happens. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I think there's something about scripture that physical presence and, and making that an ethic being so important. So with remote work, I think when I spend a whole week uh, in my office doing remote calls, I, what I'm thinking about is like, how can I be more physically present in my neighborhood? Since I'm here in my home, how can I be more physically present in my neighborhood? Because I'm not going to meetings, I'm not having a beer with Trip over in the office. Like, 
And so taking breaks in the middle of the day and going on walks, you know, and seeing neighbors and being physically present where I'm at and instead of letting the infinite, yeah. the infinity of technology kind of suck me in. Because there's something about working from home, I feel like that if you're a hard worker, you can work too much, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of us are guilty of that. So being physically present where you are, taking breaks from work and being actually a good physical neighbor too. Anyway. That's really good. Um, I think I'll skip to a question that is kind of coming out from both your comments. It's just remote work, and I've, I've heard this over and over again, and we've talked about this, there is, and you've already brought it up today, there is a level of loneliness that can naturally come if you're not really intentional with it. A word that when yeah. we were planning for this that came up a lot was the intentionality needed in remote work. Mm. And so mm. for you all, uh, can you put the other art, piece of art on the screen, Mel? Mm. Um, this, these ideas of of we are we can do work all the time wherever we're at in our in our home office does lead to a lack of in person connection that you're describing you have to be really intentional with yeah. but I'd love for you all to kind of engage with that a little bit what's what's it look like for you all to fight against loneliness in this type of work when when you can't be anywhere and oftentimes nowhere at the same time coming to a lunch and learn coming to a lunch <laughs> and learn yeah yeah one thing I would say that we try to be really intentional about. Um, I mentioned, you know, it's just the two of us, but we do have some uh, great subcontractors that work with us. Um, most of them are folks that we worked with in full-time jobs previously, so we know really well how to work together. Um, I know, I'm, I'm our project manager, so I know what they need to get their job done. They know what I expect, so there really doesn't need to be a whole lot of back and forth, just because we have that deep understanding um, so that's beautiful in that it's very efficient, it's very streamlined, um, but that could also really diminish that human connection, that personal um, effort there, right? The, the relationship element. And so um, we talked about how we try to be super intentional about sharing with them the wins that have come from the work that we've done together. So. Um, you know, one of our contractors might do a media research project for us to find who are some great writers talking about this topic that we could pitch a client to. And that could be the end of it, right? That's, that's all we asked them to do. They did the work, we sent them the check, the end. Um, but taking it a step further saying, hey, look at this awesome article that this uh, garden and gun editor wrote about this campground. Amazing. Thank you so much for finding that. Um, they're super happy with, with the work. You know, um, that makes a big difference and gives them a chance to feel the impact of their work and just to celebrate together. It just feels good for everybody. Yeah. Um, so that, that is, that's huge. Uh, but I think when it comes to like in our own lives, um, not feeling like we are, you know, in our house all the time and it's just the two of us because let's be real we have like we live in our house uh, we work in our house we like our house she cooks so she like cook we, most of our, our meals we eat in our house like it is we're there a lot um, for me again going back to being a, a people person um, I have had to be very intentional about um, being very plugged in uh, in the community uh, that I so deeply love like I I am so grateful for Chattanooga and the life that it has um, afforded me. Uh, I made a very conscious decision um, about 13 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, um, I was in sales for a marketing firm uh, and I was on the road. I, my sales territory was Texas and everything around it. And I would essentially go to Texas every Monday uh, or Arkansas or Oklahoma and I would ping around the, that area and then I'd come back on Friday, um, and then I would do my laundry, mow the yard, and then I was gone again. And after doing that for two or three years, I was like, I'm not even a member of this community. Uh, and so I made a decision I was gonna be a Chattanoogan. I did not know what that meant or what that looked like, um, but I did know that I had gone to UTC and they had young alumni opportunities. So I got involved with that. I found a nonprofit that I was, uh, that I believed in their mission. Uh, it's called La Paz Chattanooga. They work with the Latino community. Uh, they're actually a client of ours now. Um, but I reached out to them and I said, um, I don't speak Spanish, but I believe in what you're doing. How can I help? And they said, well, we've got a lawnmower with your name on it. <laughs> and so every other weekend, um, me and my uh, friend Andy, we went and mowed the yard 
So that was one less thing they had to, to deal with uh, or think about. Um, but in this remote world, um, oh, all that led to me like really starting to be involved in the community. And like Chattanooga is one of these places where you take one step forward and you'll have all this stuff right back uh, uh, in your face in, in a good way normally. Um, but in the remote world, I've, I have had to be very conscious about redoubling those efforts, uh, uh, finding boards that, uh, that I, I believe in, making, and this is something that just like is such a struggle for so many people, just find, like making sure that we're spending time with our friends. Um, there's so many things that take our attention away and demand our time and our energy and our resources. And I'll, I'll go through another year and I'll say, if it hadn't been for crossing paths with you know, my buddy at a football game, I wouldn't have seen him at all this year. Uh, and so just being very mindful to, to create those opportunities. Um, that's how I, I manage with it. Uh, for me, I'd say, too, it's the constant effort. That's, it's, it, I think, is one of the biggest struggles to just, because you have to be so intentional, so consistent with it. And it'll get away from you really quickly um, if you're not careful. Yeah, it seems like, you know, um, pre-pandemic, there was like the idea of the third space, right? Where the first place was the home, second place was the work, and third place was kind of like where you went to in between. And what I've seen, at least in my own life, and I've seen this with a lot of my peers, is like that's collapsed back into one place. Like a, there's no third space or even second space, <laughs> you know? And, um, and part of that is like I have kids, and so I kind of need to be home a lot more than the normal. But I, I have two friends that uh, work remotely, and they're, they're, I've talked to them about this topic a lot. One of them works for Meta, and he has three kids. And uh, what he figured, so he has a home office, so he's just home all the time. So there's no third space, there's no second space, there's just this one big space. And so he's created some, uh, some habits. It takes a great deal of discipline to do this, but whenever he gets off work, he like goes on a walk around his neighborhood to kind of act as his like commute home, <laughs> uh, which is funny. Um, but it actually helps him like transition from like work world to home world because he wants to be fully present when he's like in home world. And that's one of the problems with, you know, you have your phone, you're like, oh my gosh, you can get stuck back in in an instant. Uh, so I think that's a helpful example of kind of creating some rituals around getting into those third spaces again. And I think a lot of us lost those habits of second and third spaces post pandemic. So it's gonna take a lot of experimentation to, to refigure out some of that stuff. And I'm still in that, trying to figure out like, do, where do I go to a coffee shop? Because I used to go to coffee shops and then the pandemic hit and I had a third kid and I was like, okay, I guess I don't do that anymore. Um, and so I'm still relearning those habits. But then I have another friend who just had his first kid and he works remotely um, and he hasn't figured this stuff out yet. So he basically gets out of bed and starts working, you know? And he just keeps telling me like, I need to figure this out. Like I'm miserable. Like I'm just in my pajamas all day. And it's because everything has collapsed for him. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a hard thing when you're like by yourself struggling with this, not realizing that like there's like probably half the neighborhood all, are all doing the same thing, you know? So it's a struggle. It's, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of um, intentionality, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I think well, the loneliness piece and this other question kind of play off of each other. But when you can work all the time, you have to, Think about when you're not working, the, the boundaries that are put in place. Um, and that's, th those are some good examples of yeah. seeking other people, but also setting boundaries on your work environment. Uh, do you guys have other things that you want to offer in that about what boundaries can look like for someone when work is, even if you go to an office, you can do work all the time now, but in a remote setting, it's like, that's the world you swim in. What are ways that you all try to set boundaries and, and limits on your work? Time blocking, would you <laughs> say? Yeah. Um, yeah, I always, we kind of laugh about this story. When we first started our business, um, David was just busy, 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 busy. busy all the time. Ah. And, you know, I said, well, because I, David went in full time first. Um, I then left my job. Um, and so I kind of came into what was already in progress. And I'm a project manager. So I said, well, we need to block your time. That's, you know, first order of business. And he said, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> so uh, one Wednesday, I came in and sat down beside him and I said, okay, we're gonna sit down and work on your schedule. And he said, okay. And then um, by Friday afternoon, he magically said, wow, I finished all my work for the week. <laughs> and it's only Friday at three, you know? And so that's something we do. We worked together at a company before, like many moons ago, um, that had a great 
production process. So we do a production meeting every Monday where we talk through every single one of our clients. We talk about what needs to happen, who's doing it, and then we leave each other alone. Um, so that's been something that's super helpful for us um, to literally have our, our schedules mapped out so that unless something goes wrong, there shouldn't be a need for us to be working after yeah. hours. Uh, it helps compartmentalize work from non-work life. Um, but I'm also, I, I love, like I'm kind of addicted to pitching the media. It's like a game for me. Um, so if I've got like, uh, if she's cooking dinner and I've got 30 minutes, I'm like, oh, I can get two pitches out, you know? So I have to be mindful of that. One thing that we do get asked a lot, um, being married and running a business together that is at our house, um, people say, well, like, do you have a hard stop, like five o'clock, like no more work? Uh, and we don't have that. I mean, yes, we do the time blocking, um, but we, you know, we do have an agreement that if one of us is just, it's after hours, uh, and one of us is, is usually me, uh, wanting to strategize, uh, throw some ideas off the wall, um, uh, and the other one isn't feeling it, like, we just are honest about it and say, like, not right now. And the other one says, cool, I guess we are walking the dog. Um, we email ourselves a reminder yeah. so that we can come back to it. Honestly, though, I, I feel like when those things happen, we're both usually pretty excited about what, whatever the thing is. Yeah, that's a good thing about working with clients you like. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, to your, your example of the time blocking, I love that, that it seems like in y'all's story, having that built-in accountability of time blocking, that there is something about Ironically, I think sharing this, the struggles, you know, so my buddy who's had just had his first kid and he's just working all the time, he was being vulnerable. And so I was able to kind of tell him some similar things. And yeah. so I think it feels like it's important to share. I think community and accountability is just really important because not all of, the thing about work, like one way of thinking of work is probably a very broad brush way of thinking of it is that we're getting paid to perform basically, right? Like if I don't do a good job, like I'm not gonna get paid anymore. Um, and that is very addictive, especially like in American culture. Americans, America is really just an Enneagram three, you know, like we're all the chief <laughs> achievement, achievement, achievement. It's very much in the blood and in the water we, and the air. And so a lot of people, I think, just get caught up in the addiction of work because you're getting paid to perform. And that's, that can be, especially if you like your work, mm -hmm. it can be very hard to cut it off. And I just feel like there has to be accountability. There has to be a spouse or a friend or a loved one, but also just a recognition like, oh, I have to have boundaries around this. And I think because, like we talked at the beginning, because work is infinite, there's an infinite quality to it as long as the power's on, uh, it, there has to be like a holy fear kind of of it. And I think that that's something that happened to me. I think because I had children um, and, and wanted to work on my marriage and have these like relationships very close to me, like I was kind of terrified of my own addiction, you know, <laughs> like, um, like almost workaholism, you know. Um, and I think that everybody has that temptation in this culture that's very achievement oriented. Um, yeah, it's, you know, Scripture talks a lot about idols, and we always, you know, try to put names on it. And work can become that. And uh, yeah. Carl Ellis uh, once told me, idols are something that are great when they start, but they just keep wanting to take more and more mm -hmm. and more from you. They don't, they don't give you more. They take more and more. And work can be like that. So yeah. these boundaries are a good way to do that. Well, I want to make sure there's a few minutes for Q and A. But so last question for you all, in light of your faith, in light of what you do for work, uh, we got a room full of folks. A lot of the people in here are, are working remotely. Uh, what would, what's your word of encouragement to someone who's in your boat? Maybe they're earlier on in the remote work. Maybe some of the tensions we're talking about, they're feeling really acutely. What would be, in light, of, in light of what you know about Jesus, in light of what you know about this type of work, what would be a word of encouragement to the folks here? Um, I would I'm just say, like to just kind of highlight some of the things we already talked about. Um, if you don't have the discipline, like confess that to friends and get, get time blocks, find someone like Natalie yeah. that will force I time blocks on you. Um, <laughs> I, I have, Lane has been a really good help for me on this um, and, and just creating some in, kind of accountability um, and, and some structure. Um, but also like, you know, I think it's a gift to be able to have a job that you really like. And I, if I'm totally honest, I don't love my job very much. Um, I do, I've been to like 2,000 weddings, and I don't <laughs> and I don't want to go to anymore, but I still have to, you know. So there's something about like I don't know, just just uh, can, realizing that sometimes work is work, and there's parts of it that are fallen, and there's parts of it that are a gift, and you can love your neighborhood, you can love your community with, and sometimes like you can just 
you know, you can be present and be a good neighbor in your, in your neighborhood, you know, yeah. sometimes. And, and you just have to just look at, be in Zoom meetings all day. And there's not a ton you can do except for be faithfully present in that. Um, so I think that the remote work can free you up to be more present in other ways. That's, that's, that's another way of saying it, so. Yeah, I would say uh, the, the, I, I'm fortunate in that I love my job. Like, um, again, I, I, there's an addictive thing between me and it. It's a competitive thing. Um, but at the same time, it is not completely fulfilling. Uh, and I think, like, kind of going with the American culture of, like, work, 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 um, uh, we have got to be incredibly mindful of finding those things uh, that create a fulfilled life. I mean, we are here to lift each other up, and we've only got one shot at this, and so we've got to have a fulfilled uh, existence while we are here, and we have got to be able to figure out what those things are that um, fill our own cups, because a lot of times in work, we are being paid to perform, and we are being paid to fill other people's cups up, and at the end of the day, it becomes very easy for us to look around and say, I am on empty. Uh, I did roll out of bed this morning, get my laptop and start working, and then by noon forget, did I brush my teeth? Uh, and then the next thing you know, it's dinner time, and, or you got time to go get the kids, and then all that takes over. So being incredibly mindful, and again, we've said this word a bunch today, intentional about uh, identifying what those things are that truly give you a fulfilled experience or existence here, and investing that time uh, that is necessary to have that richness of life. Uh, because if we don't do that, uh, we will blink and a decade will have passed and we'll have a bunch of two-dimensional relationships uh, on computer screens. Uh, to your point, uh, just one more, the spiritual discipline of Sabbath uh, for the people of God always was the one day where you were, you know, at the end of creation, God rests because he's, he's showing, you know, these uh, slaves that have been freed from Egypt that you're not your performance. Like you're not how many bricks you make in a day, you know your quota of bricks, um, and so that's a the the, the, the issue. Or the reason why we need Sabbath is that it is the one day we remind ourselves that we're not what we perform. Like we're accepted and loved. And so I do think that there's something about that embodiment, that physical action of taking Sabbath, of turning a phone off once a week. Andy Crouch has lots of good resources on this. That kind of is is a, a good practical way of of kind of going against that performance culture. So. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is, and this I feel like I'm speaking to myself, is just remember that you can reach out. Um, if you're, whether you're part of a team or if you're on your own, or if you're just running into a challenge and you think, I bet this person has a, an answer for this, or I could ask, remember there are people in your life who would, who would be more than happy to answer your questions, to give you some feedback. Um, and they, they can make time. It's, it's really easy to feel like you're drawing too much on folks, but I think people are so willing and so um, glad to know that they're the kind of person that you would want to reach out to. So. You know, I love we're ending this here. You guys are talking a lot about the pouring in and the pouring out that goes in and the balance and caring for yourself and caring for others. And um, just makes me think of a verse that's really just been on my heart this year on Colossians 2 6, where it's talking about us being rooted in Christ. That our, that our fullness is found in Christ. And the verse ends with this little line where it says, and therefore we go out overflowing with thankfulness. And you know, this idea that, that Jesus is our fullness already. So like, like you said, work can't fill us up. Time, I'm, something's always pouring out of me. Something's, that if Christ is our fullness, then when we get to do work, it comes from a place of joy and gratefulness than from a place of earning or proving. And one of the things that really stuck out to me that you all talked about was, and I think you said it, Joey, was that shift from I think it was doing work, uh, performing in work to doing work to perform. Yeah. That's, that's such a pouring out of a thing that yeah. when you're staring at a screen, you're always justifying my existence. Yeah. That, no, my existence is in Christ, that he has done it all the work for me, that if my fullness is him, then all the things I do, it's just an overflowing of the fullness I already have in him. Mm -hmm. And the practices that you guys mentioned are hopefully can push us in that direction. Yeah. So thank you all for sharing that. Can we give them a round of applause? Um, we, got, we got time for maybe two questions. Is there any questions in the audience? So we'll start here and then we'll go there and then we'll go there. Okay. Um, so my question is, when I work for a large company as a remote employee, um, a secular company, where you know, talking about your faith may or may not be welcome. So what does it look like to represent Christ or share your faith with being explicit 
with sharing the gospel is not necessarily an option. Mm, that's right. Uh, I mean, my answer, I don't think it's very long. Uh, faithful presence is a shorthand for this. Um, and faithful presence, I think, looks like just the fruits of the Spirit. And I've noticed in my work, when I'm exempli exemplifying the fruits of the Spirit, right? We don't need to name them all off. Um, that is probably the best I can offer, you know? Um, and what I've seen that play out is I have employees that have made big mistakes and um, throughout my years and just going in and covering for them, you know? And that's like a, that's a great illustration of like substitutionary atonement, you could say. Um, but there's ways that you can live it out in those ways, I think. But um, the fruit of the spirit and cultivating that is, in my experience, one of the best ways to do that. I have a little, a tiny, um thing on, stuck to my monitor that says, um, yeah, it essentially just ha says Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Um, and there are definitely days and moments where I need that little reminder that this frustrating moment, what can I do Christ-like? Um, so that's, that's my, that's how I would say I embody it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad you, I was going to tee her up to say that. Oh, um, so, said it myself. Yeah, there it is. You Thanks. said it yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. Just being that ex being that example, um, and uh, and and uh, knowing that um, that you can still be a blessing to somebody else's life even if you're not, you know, professing your faith. Yeah. Uh, and and that is a, a, a momentous thing to do. Justin. Yeah. So I was going to come at this from a little bit of a different angle. I work that has a pretty strong office culture, but I have a lot of remote coworkers uh, and subcontractors that work with me. How can those of us who are on the other side of this love our remote staff and remote team well? Yeah, I, I had just come back in my mind to kind of what I mentioned about making sure that they're included, um, making sure that they're actively thanked, making sure um, I think just people feeling appreciated is, to me, the biggest thing. I, I've worked with different remote teams. One of the companies I worked for previously had folks um, all the way in India, all the way in the Philippines. And, you know, joining, trying to put them in a happy hour office situation, like that didn't make sense or work, but um, going beyond just giving them a performance review and daily including them on what they're doing well, how how what they are doing is actually lifting up the whole team, I think, goes, goes so far. To, to your example, I, like to hers, the, I, I just don't think you should underestimate the power of physical artifacts. Like, okay. yeah, that too. like, like the lemon cookies thing. Like I just, I, I've got, sometimes I get handwritten notes from, from people or I'll send them to people. And those just, even if you write the identical thing in an email, it's just completely different experience because I do think it's like a protest against virtuality and saying like materiality still kind of matters somehow, you know? Like we can't take communion on Zoom, you know? And like, and so a way that you can kind of protest against it, I feel like is still, I think that's a great example of like, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to care for those people, yeah. I don't know. That's and getting to know them as human beings too, um, which I'm sure you're probably already doing, but um, yeah. rather than hopping on a call to only talk about work, um, making sure you're asking questions about family and you know, personal interests so that you can show them that you remember those things and care about those things and check in on those things. Um, yeah. okay. one, we have one last question. Yep. Mine was the same question about coworkers um, that are maybe virtual. So. Perfect. Cool. Well, y'all, thank you so much for being here. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you for helping us wrap up our uh, Who Is My Neighbor Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I hope, uh, if this is your first one, I hope it was a blessing. If you've been to all of them, thank you. I hope it's been a blessing. When we do these events, it's about what we do up here, but more about what happens as you get to connect with other folks. On the table are QR codes. Uh, if you want to get on our newsletter and know what we have coming down the pipeline. But I'm going to tell you about a couple things as we go into the summer months that are coming up that you can just know about and you can find more at the website. Uh, but the first thing is this summer, we're going to be running three separate book clubs technically two book clubs and one discussion group. But we're running three book clubs. I'm gonna be leading one on a book called The Wise Leader by a man named Uli Chi, who's actually gonna be coming to town and doing a lunch and learn in October. And we're gonna be talking about wisdom and leadership. Um, 
there's a book uh, that Megan Castle, who's the CFO at Biltwell Bank, is going to be leading on women work and calling. And it's a short, beautiful little book specifically designed for women to think about what it looks like um, in, in the workplace. And then Dr. Ben Mitchell, who's just retired from Union University, a philosophy professor, is going to be leading an uh, article discussion over four weeks on AI in the workplace and talking about it from a, what, how does our Christian lens help us navigate that space as we move forward. So uh, you can find out more info. You can sign up for those. They're all uh, four to six weeks long and happen throughout the summer, and you can find the dates on our website. The other big thing that we're uh, uh, advertising for, a couple things, if you're a remote worker and you're feeling burnout, our good friends at Whiteboard are hosting an event on May 31st. And uh, I'll be at it, but it's a day-long event that they're co-hosting with the Big Self School, Shelly and Chad Prevost, to be a, hopefully a gift to folks in the creative space, remote workers who are feeling burnout. Uh, we're partnering with them to provide a discount code, so you can actually uh, get 20% uh, off, I think it is, with uh, the promo code FAITH. If you sign up for that event, you can find more on their thing on, on May 31st. And then the last, oh, oh yeah. Then the other thing is we run up, one of the programs we run, and um, Blake just finished up the program, and anyone else in here do this program? What? Yes, that's right. Thank you. I couldn't see your face. We run a program called the Main and Market Fellows for established professionals in town. That's nine months long, meets for 26 sessions over Monday nights. It's a big commitment. But if you're actually ready to take a deep dive into how the Bible is affecting your work and what it might look like to imagine bringing uh, acts of renewal to the place God has you, we'd love to have you consider being a part of that program. It starts up in September. I can talk to you more about it if you want. And then the last thing is on August 23rd, we're hosting a day-long event that we're titling The Posture of Our Politics. As we enter another election season that is already feeling polarized, uh, we want to take a step back from the conversation of who we should vote for, what policies we should support, and as Christians, though, have a family conversation about what is actually happening to me. How am I being formed and shaped in this process? How does my view of politics shape my view of God? How does my view of God shape my politics? And so we have four authors from outside of town coming in. Their pictures are up on the screen. We're having the leader of the uh, governor's office of faith-based and community initiatives coming to tell stories of what the ways churches and nonprofits are meeting needs in our, in our state outside of the vote, using political power outside the vote around foster care and um, pr um, prison rates. Uh, we have a local panel of leaders here in town from all kinds of political ideologies that are believers going to be talking about what it looks like for them to navigate polarization and be faithful in the witness. And so it's going to be a day long of just really hopefully having a conversation with other believers about what it actually means for us to engage this process with faithfulness in a way that actually is the hands and feet of Christ and a sweet aroma to the city. Oftentimes we get stuck in what not to vote for the who's in house, but how is we as a body of Christ enter this, whether we vote one way or the other, to be the body of Christ and a picture to the city of what that could look like. I hope you, if you want, come talk to me about it. We'd love to have you block the whole day off and come be a part. These speakers are top notch. And uh, after the event, we're going to have book discussions on all their books and we're going to have a prayer guide to give you. It's going to be a full on thing. We'd love to have you be a part. I talked more about it than I would wanted to, but come see me if you want to learn more about that. Thank you for engaging with what we have at Faith Co-op. I hope it's a blessing to you, and I hope you keep coming back, and it can be something to help you remember the gospel in light of what you do every day. Thanks so much.